From the University of Notre Dame, these are Notre Dame Stories. In this episode, new research shows how breastfeeding can mitigate the impact of the violence children experience in the womb. And we turn to the Rome Global Gateway to look at the layered experiences that combine to make Notre Dame in Rome. to stop children and women being exposed to violence in the first place, right? Um, That's an obvious thing that when we're looking at kind of the long-term effects of violence can sometimes get lost. And so I think it's important to always restate that, right? That our priority is to keep women and children safe. Laura Miller-Graff is the William J. Shaw Center for Children and Families Assistant Professor of Psychology and Peace Studies. Her research focuses on intimate partner violence, or IPV. Intimate partner violence. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a, a, a clinical term for just what we would normally call an abusive relationship? Or how does its definition differ in this context? Sure. I think in terms of common language, most people would say abusive relationship or domestic yeah. violence or something like that. Intimate partner violence is a bit different or more specific in some ways. So it refers to psychological, sexual, physical, and economic abuse against Mm. a current or former partner or spouse. Um, So it's very specific to an intimate or romantic relationship, um, whereas domestic violence often can refer to violence more broadly occurring within the home. Mm. And it's a little bit different, I would say, or we prefer it clinically, right, over something like an abusive relationship, because a lot of people don't necessarily understand understand what they've experienced as abuse. Like they wouldn't Mm. name it that um, necessarily. Um, And so, you know, using a a different term or conceptualization can be maybe a little more specific or helpful in some cases. Talk to me about uh, economic abuse. I Mm -hmm. assume that's mostly in the former partner context, that things like child support or what does that encompass? Yeah, it um, can happen in both uh, ongoing relationships and kind of past relationships. Um, So child support is a great example of one um, partners can leverage, right, for maintaining coercive control over a former partner. Um, But there are other ways that current partners exert economic forms of violence or abuse. So um, one common one would be restricting access or use to financial income in the household, right? Restricting women's access to bank accounts or how much money they're allowed to spend or tracking women's spending Mm. very carefully carefully, you know, making them log, you know, how much money did you spend on gas and where did this money go and that money? Um, Or, you know, threatening them if they don't hand over, say, like their tips from waitressing Hmm. or something like that. Um, So we see it kind of implemented in diverse ways. But the common undergirding theme of a lot of economic abuse is an attempt to maintain coercive control over the partner um, through financial means. That was um, going to be my my next question. Uh, Where do we cross the line into um, what we'd say abusive behavior in economic context and other contexts Mm -hmm, as well? mm -hmm. Yeah, there's not a clear black and white line. Mm necessarily, right? Especially um, for types of violence, like psychological violence, right? It's hard to say when something often crosses a line from, say, maybe a heated conflict to something we would consider more abusive. Um, So really, as researchers, what we're often looking for um, is the severity and the frequency of those types of behaviors, right? It's really different um, if it's happening once or twice a year versus every day Um, and then the kind of qualitative intent of those types of behaviors right so are they in response to you know you're having a fight about money because somebody lost a job and that's a difficult time and kind of a natural Mm -hmm. you know economic stressor right in a relationship or is it really an attempt by one particular partner to maintain some form of control over their relationship and qualitatively those are pretty different things and they feel different right Mm. in the context of a relationship right okay Mm -hmm. now you um you know kind of maybe one subset of your research into ipv is um involving pregnant women Mm -hmm. 
My work in graduate school focused on the effects of partner violence on children in the preschool age range, so from three to five. And what I was looking at there was children's um, cognitive perceptions of threat and self-blame relative to the violence that they Hmm. had witnessed in the home. We know from research that kids are, in fact, most vulnerable to exposure to partner violence in the home when they're young because they're spending a lot more time in the home environment relative to older children who spend a lot of time in school. Mm -hmm. Um, And for kids who are living in violent homes, the rates of exposure are very, very high. So over 90% have at least heard some violence, um, yelling, or, you know, have observed the effects of physical violence, and many children have also witnessed it. And not surprisingly, the research shows that, you know, that has negative effects for children's development. And certainly my graduate research showed that kids who were exposed to partner violence had higher rates of threat, higher rates of self-blame than kids who were not or who were exposed to less partner violence. Mm. Um, But I think what is significant about that or was significant for me is when you're working with parents, um, particularly of really young kids, a lot of parents make the assumption that because my kids can't express fully um, that they understand what's going on, that they don't understand what's going on Mm. or that it doesn't affect them very significantly. Um, And the research just shows that that is not the case, right? Um, Even if kids can't articulate Mm the meaning of the fights that their parents are having. It's still showing some discernible effects on their development. Mm. The other thing that was notable to me in that research um, and other research would suggest this as well, is that for a lot of those families, violence had been ongoing for a long time. Uh, So it's not as if kids were three, suddenly violence started between their parents. I mean, certainly there's some cases where Mm -hmm. that's true. But for many families, violence had been ongoing for a number of years. And we know from the epidemiological research that the most common time of onset for IPV is during pregnancy. So Mm. already by the time kids are three or four, they've been exposed to three or four years of violence often, right? Um, And one of my main interests coming to Notre Dame was thinking about, you know, how do we back up the clock and think about prevention uh, at the earliest stages uh, for kids. And for me, that meant, you know, what do we what do we do about violence in pregnancy and thinking about how we protect women from that uh, and also then how we protect children from the adverse consequences of violence in in early childhood. The effect on children in utero is fascinating. If I've heard that before, I've forgotten it. Can you elaborate on that? Our research would suggest that even when moms experience violence when they're pregnant, so children aren't direct witnesses um, to the violence, there are still discernible effects for them um, as they enter infancy and toddlerhood. And those effects are explained by a number of different mechanisms that I think research hasn't fully elucidated at this point, but we know Mm. some of the relevant ones would be the ways in which partner violence and pregnancy affects mom's mental health, certainly, um, and the ways in which it affects their parenting. um, Because partner violence, of course, um, leaves many women um, in situations where they're very stressed out. They have a partner who is either an absent parent or not a very supportive parenting partner. Um, And so it's more difficult to parent in that context, no question. Mm -hmm. Um, And that has implications for kids. And there's a lot going on in pregnancy related to women's stress. And this is where I say, you know, research really needs to elucidate still these mechanisms because we know that women who are experiencing partner violence in pregnancy have higher rates of pregnancy complications. They have higher rates of labor and delivery problems. Mm. So there is some suggestion that this higher level of stress potentially does have not just emotional implications for moms, but actual physical complications uh, for their health and for the health of their baby babies really, really early on. Mm. Talk to me about the role 
breastfeeding plays? Well, the breastfeeding question was driven um, in large part by the WIC office. Uh, because they have a vested interest in their breastfeeding programming. They wanted to know um, if essentially it was a helpful piece of programming and any insights into how they could maybe do it better or tailor it better to the needs of the women accessing the WIC office. So from their perspective, that was their interest in that question. From our perspective um, in the research lab, one of my interests when we think about um, violence as it occurs in families is about what mechanisms are, are present that can facilitate resilience for women and children. And in particular, one of my interests is in kind of these intergenerational relational processes. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, breastfeeding, I think about as one of the earliest interactions, relational interactions that mothers and their kids have, right? Most women um, breastfeed within the first hour of birth or try to breastfeed within the first hour of birth at the hospital. Mm -hmm. So it's a really early initiation of both that physical and emotional interaction um, with their child. And so it's an interesting potential protective mechanism to examine from that perspective. Um, and certainly there's many other ways, right, that women sure. develop their relationship with their child. It's only one. Um, mm -hmm. But that's the one we were focusing on in that particular study. What, um, so what did you find? What are you, what are you finding as you, as you look into this? What we were looking at in that particular study was the relationship between prenatal IPV, so partner violence um, during pregnancy, and its effects on infant temperament. So infant temperament refers to how infants respond and regulate themselves in reaction to their environment. And we know from past research, and we saw in our study as well, that prenatal IPV poses a risk for infant temperament and in that um, moms who experience partner violence in pregnancy are more likely to report that their infants are difficult to soothe. Um, and in our study, they reported lower levels of what's called positive affect, so like smiling, laughing, things like that. Mm. And what we looked at was how breastfeeding at six weeks postpartum um, affected the relationship between partner violence in pregnancy and infant temperament at four months. And what we found was that for women who were currently breastfeeding at six weeks postpartum, the relationship was much weaker than for women who were not breastfeeding. So when women weren't breastfeeding, we saw that expected relationship between partner violence having a negative effect on infant temperament. And for women who were breastfeeding, we didn't see evidence of that relationship. Mm. So that would suggest to us that breastfeeding is exerting some kind of a protective or buffering effect for child adjustment, which we thought was pretty exciting. That's a really interesting initial finding. Do you have mm -hmm. any, any, any guesses why? Is it just that emotional relationship building function? Yeah, it's an awesome question. And it's not one we evaluated in the right. study. But I think, yeah, moving forward in terms of future research, that's a really important question. I mean, certainly I have some hypotheses about sure. why. Um, I think from looking at other research, there's reason to believe that women um, or the experience of breastfeeding for women and children supports mother-infant bonding um, and kind of the early attunement to children's signals, so something that we would call parenting sensitivity, right? Being able to notice when your child is distressed and respond quickly to that. Um, and so it's possible that that would maybe be an explanatory factor, um, but there could be others as well. Um, but that's probably the one I would yeah. maybe look at measuring next. Okay. Mm -hmm. What else do you think you need to, to do next? Yeah, I think one of the things that I know was a particular question for us, um, and we don't have a good answer based on our data, right. is, you know, what... Um, um, what helps women or what are the right kinds of support that can help women to breastfeed? Because we know that, you know, a lot of women experience difficulties breastfeeding. Um, some women can't breastfeed. So some of the questions that would be important to me moving forward and thinking from, you know, a policy perspective right. is how do we provide the right supports, particularly for women who are experiencing partner violence for breastfeeding? Um, because we know that women who are exposed to partner violence have lower rates of breastfeeding. Um, and how do we, and this gets at the question of why, so for women who can't breastfeed, what are other ways, right, that we can promote resilience in those moms and families? Okay. Um, because, yeah, we, we want to, of course, do that for, for all families. I think one um, important 
piece, certainly, of my work is thinking about the relationship between basic research, so this kind of research that observes the effects of violence and different risk and protective mechanisms as they unfold over time, and intervention. Yeah. Uh, because we want to, in, in the ideal world, and certainly in my work, think about you know how we take that basic research and how we use it to inform good practice, right? Um, so what we are doing in our research lab is integrating some of that information and information, of course, from other studies into uh, a group therapy program for pregnant women. And right now we're piloting that, we're wrapping up a pilot pilot, um, looking at its effects on women's partner violence, revictimization, mental health, and infant development. Mm. Um, and we're about to transition into what's called a head-to-head trial. So we're comparing it not just against a no-treatment control group, because um, we now know at this point, you know, getting the group therapy is better than nothing. So that's good, mm-hmm. but maybe not super meaningful always. Um, we want to see if it is better than also receiving some other kind of support service. Okay. Um, so that's kind of our, our next phase. Laura Miller Graff, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It was a rainy and seasonably cool evening in Rome when a group of Notre Dame students arrived at the Basilica of St. Bartholomew on the island located on Tiber Island in the heart of the Eternal City. The church was built in the 10th century and houses relics of St. Bartholomew, one of the 12 apostles of Christ. It's said that the miracles of St. Bartholomew involve the weight of objects, and so maybe it's fitting that the students are here to alleviate a burden. So we're doing panini this evening, and so we're first going to be cutting up... They're making paninis and soup to deliver to Rome's homeless. This is one of the community-based learning opportunities through a course called All Roads Lead to Rome, which all students take when they study abroad here. They'll return many times throughout the semester, more than they're required to. One of them told us, Rome is giving us so much, we want to give something back. I think we can we can seem a lot of times those four thousand plus miles seem seem to be a long distance from uh, from campus, especially in the winter. You sit in the Roman sun and you 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 think uh, it's uh, we're we're in another world. Uh, but to me, at least, I I see uh, the gateway as very much a part of. Uh, the university. That's Heather Hyde Minor, the academic director of the Rome Global Gateway, the facility that is the center of Notre Dame's presence in the Eternal City. The university really from the beginning, so if we think back uh, to, to Father Soren, for instance, um, he made 52 transatlantic voyages in his his lifetime, and that's that, that was in the 19th century. <laughs> so his idea, I think, for our university was always one that was uh, was global. It was always one that was going to reach around around the world. So in a way, I think what we're doing here is really, it's, it's a new project, but it's an old idea, and it's, it's really his idea, which is that, that, that we, we should become a force um, for good uh, in the world, uh, in other places, and that this, this university this, that he, he dreamed of and created was always going to be international, was always going to be global in its, in its scope and its, in its reach. So in a way, I think we're just, we're just taking up his, his mission or his, uh, his idea and what we, what we do here. Notre Dame's permanent presence in Rome traces back 50 years when the School of Architecture established the Rome Studies Program for its third-year students. In 2001, other undergraduates joined them in their fields of study. The gateway was built in 2014 and a residential villa a few years later. And while they define Notre Dame's presence here in simple, literal terms, Miner notes that the university's partnerships in Rome give its influence a dimension that can't be measured by square footage. Our goals really are the goals of the university. To advance knowledge and research, uh, and to do that 
from undergraduates, to graduate students, of course, for our, 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 our faculty. We work with uh, everything from particle physicists at the, at the Sapienza, the University of, of Rome, uh, to the Vatican Library, one of our, our wonderful research uh, partners here. We want to combine in every possible way we can research as part of what the students, our students do here. The kind of idea that there's a separation between research and, and learning or research and teaching doesn't, doesn't exist at all here, especially because for the Rome Gateway, our, 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 cl our classroom uh, and our laboratory and our library and our research center is the city. The partnership with the Vatican Library was formalized in 2016 with the signing of an agreement of collaboration and exchange. The far-reaching agreement is the only one of its kind the library has with an American academic institution and has laid the groundwork for visits and informal exchanges of faculty, scholars, librarians, and administrators. Yet these kinds of dynamic and varied academic offerings are given place because of the personal enrichment a time away from campus provides. Or, as Miner puts it, there's more to be gained here than what looks good on paper. I, I always encourage students not so much to, to, to come here and think about how I can add something to my resume that will be attractive to an employer, or how can I check off some more requirements that I need uh, to complete um, to, to, to get to my standing in the stadium and receiving my, uh, my Notre Dame degree. But instead, to trust themselves enough to follow their instincts a little bit. If something seems interesting and worthwhile, even if it's not exactly clear what the benefit will be, what will come out of it in the end, that this is a time for them, a place away from campus, for them to allow themselves to try new things. I think that the best experiences of, of studying outside the United States uh, educate students in a number of different ways, and one of the ways in the, the best possible scenario that they can be educated is to learn some things about themselves. That same evening that the students were preparing sandwiches and soup at the Basilica of St. Bartholomew, another group was immersing themselves in the city in a much more audible way. At the villa, a language exchange was taking place. Notre Dame students gather with their Italian college student peers, each group with a desire to sharpen their skills in the other group's native tongue, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. It was another example that showed Notre Dame was in Rome, and Rome was a part of Notre Dame. We see ourselves not as Notre Dame in part of the city, or not as Notre Dame, uh, a kind of version of it imported uh, from, from campus, although we are that, but that we very much see ourselves here as Notre Dame in Rome. Notre Dame in Rome really is grounded, implanted in the city. Our foundation really is Rome. We don't, we don't wait for it to come to us. We go out and, and are immersed in it in all kinds of different ways. And I think that that's really the kind of, at the core of what it is that we're trying, we're trying to accomplish here.